and thank you for inviting me again. It's good to be with you. Time is short. Let's turn to business. Watching the news is excruciating. You can't get anything straight. You can't get to the bottom of anything. And it's almost completely fact-free. There's a second problem with it. If you're watching Fox News and reading the Wall Street Journal, and your neighbor is watching CNN and reading the New York Times, you have a completely different idea of what's going on in the world. And one reason we're so divided as a country is that we're seeing different things. You know, the news media is our radar. And if everybody's looking at a different radar screen, it's chaos. Imagine the next time you're flying overseas, the pilot's looking at one radar screen, the co-pilot's looking at another radar screen, the navigator's looking at a third radar screen. It's a shouting match in the cockpit. What a lot of people don't realize is that the CIA was built to be the president's radar. Our job was to tell President Reagan what the future was going to be and to tell him that future soon enough and clearly enough so he could prepare for the future. And if he didn't like the future, he could change the future before it happened. That was the whole point. Did we use spies in covert action? Of course we did. And the purpose of spies and covert action is to get that information to the president so he could shape the future rather than be the victim of it. Once a year, we would stop everything and prepare for President Reagan what we called a global intelligence briefing, our best shot at what the future was going to be. The great director, it was Bill Casey, would deliver this to President Reagan. Reagan being Reagan, he would ask Bill to take this briefing to some other people he wanted to hear it. For example, Margaret Thatcher, or Pope John Paul II. This morning, I want to do for you what we used to do for President Reagan. I want to paint a picture of the world that lies in front of you. If I'm right, it's a more interesting picture than you're getting from the news, and there are some extraordinary business opportunities emerging that you may not be aware of yet, and I want to show you what those are. One point before we begin. There's a trend in our country that's unhealthy. We argue before we understand. That is not a smart thing to do. It sets a terrible example for young people. When there are complicated and contentious issues, honorable people will disagree about what to do. That's fine. Intelligent people should be able to reach a common understanding of what the problem is before we start screaming about what the solution is. It doesn't happen anymore. Everything's a shouting match. Watch the politicians. Watch the talk shows, even when I'm one of the guests on Fox or MSNBC or one of the big radio shows. It's miserable. Everybody's shouting past everybody else. The one thing you never hear anymore in public life is, that's an interesting point you just made. I hadn't thought about that. I'm going to change my mind. No one ever changes their mind. Let's not do that. I've left my politics upstairs in the room. If you want to know what I would do about all these issues, buy me a beer some evening. I will be happy to tell you in great detail how to solve all the world's problems. <laughs> Let's leave the partisan stuff out of this. If we can reach an understanding of what's happening, what it means to your businesses, we'll have accomplished a lot. So let's light up the radar screen and see what's out there. When you look at the world, what you see is that the world is becoming modern. The best way to understand what modernity means is to think back to a time before we were modern. So think of Europe at the end of the 17th century, 1690, 1695. Life was awful. Lifespan was very short, mid-40s in most places. Most people were half starved most of the time. When they prayed, they prayed that when the next famine came, at least some of their children might survive. People were illiterate, uneducated. Women weren't allowed to be educated. Travel was rare. Most people spent their entire lives within 20 miles of where they'd been born. You had no say in how you were governed. You were a peasant, you were a servant. You just shut up and did what you were told. And nothing changed. Tomorrow is the same as yesterday. The modern world is completely different. Lifespan's nearly 80, and no one's starving out there. We have poor people among us. We have people with serious economic problems. They need serious economic help. 
No one's starving in the United States or in the modern world. That's an enormous achievement. It's happened within our lifetimes. It is so extraordinary that today we are told by the United States government the biggest health problem faced by poor people in our country is obesity. It's a big problem, but gee, can you imagine going back to a bunch of peasants 300 years ago, telling them the biggest health problem their descendants will have is obesity? It's an incredible achievement. People are educated, literate. Women are educated. They own businesses. They run for political office. We travel all the time. We have a huge say in how we're governed, and nothing stays the same. The technical word for the change we live with, as Walt was talking about, it's innovation. Somebody comes along and says, there's a better way to do this. They start a business. They hire people. Standards of living go up. There's a whole industry doing it. There's a second idea. Someone starts another business. Now there's a second industry, a third industry, a fourth industry. Five, 10, 30 years later, someone has an even better way to do it. That completely changes the first industry than the second and the third. It's like an escalator that never actually stops. Like with any piece of machinery, from time to time it breaks down, as it did in 2008, 2009. If you don't have a good firm grip on the guardrail, you can get hurt. Then the escalator picks up again, it goes. That's us, that's the modern world, that's how we live. Our transition to modernity wasn't smooth and seamless. The 18th and 19th centuries were violent. In 1861, the United States broke apart into a civil war over slavery. Before that civil war ended, we killed more than 700,000 of each other. Remember how small our population was. We killed more than 700,000 of each other and a president was assassinated. That's worse than anything that's ever happened in Iraq. And it happened here, it happened to us. We got through it. The 20th century was ghastly. World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Bosnia, fascism, communism. Look what it took to get us here. Today, when we look at all the violence and turmoil in the Mideast, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Libya, Syria, all the rest, what we're looking at is the entire Islamic world beginning to make the journey we began more than 300 years ago. And what we keep saying to these people is, can't you guys do this by next Thursday? Well, no, look how long it took us. Look at the mistakes we made, we still make mistakes. There's a specific reason why it's going to be difficult. That's the nature of Islam. When you study history, it's the story of competing operating systems. There's one thing we all understand, competing operating systems. Our operating system is Western civilization. In Western civilization, it's the individual who's at the center of it. Church and state are separate. The rule of law, the idea of property rights, economic liberty, individual rights, human rights. In Western civilization, we unleash the entrepreneurial talents of our people. We encourage intellectual curiosity. It's an endless struggle for equality among the races and the sexes. Islam's a different operating system. It varies from country to country. But in Islam, church and state are combined. They don't have that separation. It's a political structure and a faith. And in a lot of countries, you do not have the option to opt out. Islam does not unleash the entrepreneurial talents of its people, and it discourages intellectual curiosity. That's why there hasn't been a scientific breakthrough from the Islamic world in over a thousand years. And this is a tragedy. The Muslims are geniuses. They invented algebra. It's an Arabic word. It's algebra. They virtually invented medicine. In every field of science and technology, they led the world. And then everything stopped. There's no other example in history of that happening. If you spend a thousand years crushing intellectual curiosity and slaughtering your geniuses, you won't get new science. You won't get new technology. The great tragedy is we have no way of knowing what the human race might have known by now if they hadn't have done that. There's one other feature of that operating system that, that's very relevant. Again, it varies from country to country, but in that operating system, women are treated like property instead of people. Very simply put, that operating system is incompatible with the modern world. That's the glitch. What we're looking at now is a billion and a half people, the entire Islamic world, beginning to write the code 
for version 2.0, beginning to figure out how to reconcile the principles of their faith, which are marvelous, with modernity, the way Judaism and Christianity began to figure it out centuries ago. Is it going smoothly? No, of course not, but it's going. And one of the features of modernity is that good news isn't news. Airplane lands on time isn't a Fox News alert. There are a lot of good things happening you may not have heard about because the news media doesn't report them. For example, three years ago in Afghanistan, they held presidential elections that will go down as one of the great events of the 21st century. They had more candidates for president than the Republican Party had in 2016, that 22, 23 candidates. They held a series of televised debates. Young people were out campaigning, tweeting. They had the first round of voting. They eliminated a bunch of candidates. They had the second round of voting. They eliminated more candidates. They were down to the third and final round of voting. Two candidates left. It's politics. It's Afghanistan. It was getting intense. A week before the scheduled vote, the two candidates met privately then walked out to the television cameras and announced they had agreed to govern together. One as president, the other as chief executive of Afghanistan. They're the government. The president's a modern man. His daughter is an artist. She lives in Brooklyn. These elections in Afghanistan were better managed and the votes more accurately counted than anything we will see for another 50 years in Chicago. A friend of mine in Chicago says I'm a hopeless optimist. In Egypt, the president, al-Sisi, went to the most important mosque in Cairo. This is like going to the Vatican. There were 250 imams. He stuck it to them. He said, you guys failed us. You never taught us how to reconcile our faith with the modern world. That's why everything's going wrong. That's what you should have done. He went on and on. It was a stunning speech. It's echoing across the Mideast. It's being studied all through the Mideast. It never made the news here. And when he finished the speech, he did something no Egyptian leader had ever done. He went to a church, he met with Christians. He said, we've not treated you well, but you're, you're Egyptians, please stay. Good for him. The king of Jordan, Abdullah, is a modern man, helicopter pilot. He's trying to turn Jordan into what he calls the Silicon Valley of the Mideast. He's got companies like Apple, Intel, IBM, who've set up research facilities there and are hiring young Jordanians. That's terrific. No country's gone as far as Morocco to improve the rights of women. The crown prince of Saudi Arabia gave a speech a few weeks ago. He said, we cannot continue to be an oil-based economy. In the 21st century, to create jobs for our young population, we need to become an entrepreneurial economy. That's revolution. 15 of the 19 hijackers on 9-11 were Saudis. Now he's turning Saudi Arabia into a modern state. They're turning away from that radical Wahhabi form of Islam. They just passed a law allowing women to become entrepreneurs and form companies. Finally, after 14 centuries, there are the beginnings of a sense of humor in that part of the world. Royal Brunei Airlines, has a daily flight into Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. It's a 787, that's the big one. A few months ago, they flew it in with an all-woman crew. I had no idea they had women pilots. They landed at Jeddah, taxied to the gate, unloaded 300 passengers, and the crew took a selfie of themselves in the cockpit of the plane. The pilot looked like every 787 captain you've ever seen. She's 50, 55 years old, white shirt, four stripes on her shoulder, and a headscarf. Co-pilot looked, you know, 40, 45, white shirt, three stripes and a headscarf. Navigator looked about 30, white shirt, headscarf. They sent out the selfie and they said, look, we just landed a 787 at your airport. You won't let us rent a car to drive to our hotel. Well, everyone in Saudi Arabia did what you just did. They laughed. Two weeks ago, Saudi Arabia changed the law. Women can drive. Don't be discouraged by everything going wrong. You don't hear about what's going right. What we do hear about, obviously, are ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the terrorist attacks. This is serious stuff. They can kill a lot of people. They can't win. What all this is, these attacks, it's the last gasp against modernity. If you've been to the Mideast, 
You've seen this on television. These gentlemen, they're sitting at a cafe. They're drinking these tiny cups of sweet coffee. They're smoking cigarettes. When the cafe closes, they go home. They walk in the front door. No one talks back to them. No one. My wife talks back to me. So is my daughter. We're saying to these guys, come into the modern world. Get a job, get a car. Your wife will get a washer and a dryer. Your daughter will go to college. He's looking right back at us and saying, oh, my wife has, what do you call this, a charge card? I turn to my 14-year-old daughter. I say, where do you think you're going dressed like that? She won't even take headphones off to talk to me. Don't tell me to live like that. It's not how my father or grandfather lived. By the way, there's a point in there. There is a percentage of men for whom the leap from the 7th century to the 21st century is too big. They can't do it. So along comes Al-Qaeda. And they say, don't fall for that modern baloney. They're taking away your respect. Right now, anybody talks back to you, smack it. You come with us. We'll give you a bomb. We'll give you a gun. You walk down the street, people look at you. I hate to say it, but I could find 100 guys like that in Los Angeles. I could find them in Chicago, London, Paris, Stockholm, Tokyo. I could find three of them in the community where I live. We're given this image of the angry young Arab sitting in his room studying the Koran. No, he's not. He's looking at pornography on his iPhone. He has no idea how to cope with the modern world, and that's the appeal of the terrorists. It's serious, but they can't win. Today, your average 15-year-old in Kabul, in Cairo, in Sana, Yemen, they have a Facebook account. They've got an iPhone. They know what music people are listening to. They know what clothes people are wearing. Your average housewife knows that in our part of the world, you can go to Walmart, Ikea, get some really nice stuff at a very reasonable price. They're on our side. We're living through one of the greatest moments in history. We've waited 14 centuries for the Islamic world to step onto the road to modernity, and they've done it. No, it isn't going smoothly, but then how could it? When my kids were younger, I was confident they would go from age 10 to age 30 flawlessly. Didn't quite happen that way. Well, we didn't go from the 17th century to the modern world flawlessly, neither can they. But they're going, and this is a very big deal. Don't be discouraged. There's a second feature of modernity that's even more astonishing. As the world becomes modern, the world is becoming rich, fast. Here are the numbers. By 1980 or 1990, about two billion human beings had crossed the line out of poverty. Since then, nearly a billion more have emerged from poverty, a lot of them in China and India. In the last six years or so, about 20 million Brazilians have crossed the line out of poverty. Today on the continent of Africa, the number of people with disposable income is over 300 million. It's bigger than the U.S. population. When you put all the numbers together, here's what we've got. Each year, between 50 million and 100 million human beings now emerge from poverty. The lowest credible estimate's 50 million a year. The highest credible estimate's 100, somewhere in there. With numbers that big, you can't be too precise. And it varies from year to year. I think it's been closer to the high end, but let's be conservative. We'll drop it down. So every year, 55, 60, 72, 75 million human beings now emerge from poverty. When we say someone's out of poverty, we don't mean they have a big house with a swimming pool. To be out of poverty globally means there's enough food to eat. You're living decently, not as nicely as you live or I live, but decently. The children have been inoculated against the basic childhood illnesses. Kids are up in the morning, they've had breakfast, they're off to school. At least one of the parents has some kind of work that gives him or her some disposable income, some money to spend beyond the bare necessities of food, shelter, clothing. That's what it means to be out of poverty. Today, more human beings are reaching this point than at any time in recorded history. If this trend continues at the current rate, it's been accelerating. If it just continues at the current rate, what it means is this. Within your lifetimes, within the lifetimes of most of you sitting here this morning, certainly within your children's lifetimes, the world will cross a line that's never been crossed before, and most people have no idea that could ever be crossed. For the first time in history, 
the overwhelming majority of human beings will not be poor. Isn't that stunning? You couldn't find 100 college students in the state of California who were being told they will live in a world in which the majority of human beings will not be poor or anywhere else in the country or in Western Europe or in Asia. It's stunning. Why is it happening? We figured it out. There are some things you need a genius to figure out. Jonas Salk and the polio vaccine. One day another genius will come along, develop a pill that prevents dementia or cures cancer. Other things you don't need a genius. Little common sense and experience will do it. Good example is physical fitness. You want to be physically fit, eat sensibly, get a lot of exercise. You don't need an MD or a PhD to know that. Well, everybody knows something, more people do it. What everybody knows is you want to bring your country out of poverty, it's the free market. Property rights, rule of law, stable financial system, reasonable regulation and taxation. You put that in place, boom, country comes out of poverty. Well, everybody knows that more people do it. Today, all over the world, governments are putting in place these free market mechanisms. Did you know that seven of the world's 10 fastest growing economies are in sub-Saharan Africa? These are black countries headed by black elected officials. They're putting in place economic and financial policies the Tea Party couldn't get through Congress. Remember the Rwanda, the mass slaughter in Rwanda years ago? Uh, the Hutus machete to death, 800,000, a million Tutsis. Rwanda's now growing at 8% a year, which is why Marriott just opened a hotel in the capital of Kigali. I was giving a talk to a group of chief executives in Houston last year. And when the meeting ended, I was going to the airport. One of the people in the audience was going to the airport. We shared a taxi out. I was heading for Seattle. He was going to Kigali. Isn't that stunning? The result of all of this is what has now become the biggest underreported news story in the world, the emergence and exponential growth of a global middle class. And you see this all the time. You go off to some country you never heard of, business trip, family vacation. You get to your hotel, you go up to the room, you push back the curtains, you look out, and there's a car dealership across the road. You look to your left, it's a big shopping mall. You look to the right, it's a bunch of restaurants. You go, when did this happen? Last 20 years. Do you ever order something by telephone? Land's End, L.L. Bean, no, they bounce your call to India, the Philippines. They're bouncing your call somewhere else. There's a company in Nairobi called KenCall, Kenya Call Center. If you're sitting in a call center in Nairobi, you're in an office building, you're at a desk, got a set of headphones on, computer. You finish your work shift, you jump in the car, you pick up your kid at the daycare center, you swing over to the supermarket, get something for supper. There's a chain of supermarkets in Africa called Moss Mart. Walmart bought them. Another chain called Nakuma. It's like Costco, they put up big box stores. You go home, you flip on the flat screen TV, you catch up on the local news while you get supper on the table. After supper, walk your dog, water your plants, run your kid over to some high school soccer practice, or just settle down, watch a movie on Netflix. All over the world, we now have these middle class societies. It's astonishing. And by the way, the driving force behind this is globalization. Now, globalization is getting a very bad reputation politically. Partly, it's because it's being tangled up with another word that sounds the same. That's globalism. Globalism is that goofy idea that we all live together in peace and harmony. We don't need governments, one world kind of a thing. Globalism is the process that makes every product available all over the world at the lowest possible price. You know, your son or daughter goes off to school, you give them a cell phone so you can be in touch with them. Whether you're giving them an iPhone, Samsung, it's the best cell phone you can possibly get. There isn't a better cell phone. It can make and receive calls, you can surf the web, send text messages. If the president and Melania Trump want to give their son Barron a cell phone, it's the same cell phone. And whatever cell phone your employees are giving their kids, it's the same cell phone. There's no better cell phone. This has never happened in world history before, that ordinary people like us have the best product you can buy. If Bill Gates needs a new light bulb, well, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook needs a new toilet mechanism. You go to Ace Hardware, you go to Home Depot, you pick one up. There's no better one that they can afford that we can't. Today, young people can go to Ikea and get some really nice furniture and kitchenware. 
It's nice stuff. Like a lot of men my age, I have high blood pressure. So I take a pill for it. About 15 cents a pill keeps my blood pressure down. If the president of China has high blood pressure, they're going to give him the same pill. There isn't a better pill that he could afford and I can't. This kind of thing has never happened in history. And it's driven us forward at a rate we've never seen before to a global middle class. And this is good. It's good for several reasons. The first reason is very human. If the biggest underreported news story is the emergence of a global middle class, the second biggest underreported news story is the unprecedented improvement in global health. From 1990 to 2013, there's been a 47% drop in deaths related to malaria. That's millions of people, mostly children. There's been a 38% drop in AIDS-related deaths. Deaths related to tuberculosis have dropped by 33%. From 1990 to 2013, the number of people who die each year from diarrhea-related illnesses, mostly kids, has dropped from over 5 million to about 760,000. A group of demographers and physicians put all the numbers together. What they calculated is this. On an average day today, Tonight, when you're up in your room, you check your email one more time, lock the door, brush your teeth. The end of the day today, around the world, 17,000 children will not have died who would have died on every average day in 1990. That's the difference. Isn't that stunning? And nobody reports it. So it's good as human beings. The second reason it's good is very political. People like us don't go to war with people like us. We send nasty emails. That doesn't work, call your lawyers. Look, I'm the biggest hawk you're ever gonna meet. I was Reagan's guy at the CIA. Can't tell you 95% of what we did. Never give up your covert action capability. Never give up your armed forces. God bless the Navy SEALs over the bridge in Coronado. There's always some clown out there who's gonna cause trouble, whether it's an Adolf Hitler, Osama bin Laden, maybe Vladimir Putin. Never give up your power. But as the world becomes middle class, it's harder and harder and harder to start a war. People get busy with their jobs, with their kids, making plans for the weekend, getting together with friends, listening to music, watching movies. Most human beings would rather shop than fight. And I'll give you an example of this, Western Europe. Whenever Western Europe is in financial trouble, it's a world war. It's a one-to-one -one correlation. Western Europe today is in more financial trouble than any entity in the history of the world with the possible exception of the state of Illinois. <laughs> Give you an example of how bad this is. My wife and I just got back from a long trip to Italy. We rented an apartment in Rome. When you live in a city, you learn things you don't learn when you're in hotels running around. In Italy today, more than one-third of young Italians, young as under the age of 35, more than one-third have never held a job. That's the official figure. The real figure is about half. When's the last time you met a 17-year-old who never held a job? In Italy, about half the people under the age of 35 have never worked. The official figure is that 60% of them are still living at home with mommy and daddy. In our neighborhood, it was much higher than that. This is, by the way, a generation that will actually never work. They'll stay in school till they're 30, then they'll go on welfare, and at 55, they'll pick up pensions. It's not just a human disaster, it's an economic and political disaster. There isn't gonna be a war. Italy isn't gonna attack Ethiopia. France isn't attacking Spain. Spain's not attacking Portugal. The finance ministers will meet next week. They'll come up with another Euro loan package. There isn't gonna be a war. We find other ways to solve our problems. That's a good thing, so it's a safer world. The final reason this is so good is the one most directly related to you, it's economic. As the world emerges from poverty, as we create a global middle class, it means the total customer base for every product and service you provide is now growing at a rate of 50, 60, 80, 90, 100 million new customers every year. Boy, do we want these customers. To reach these customers, we have to develop products that are clever, inexpensive, and green. If we go about this clumsily, the water's gonna be polluted, can't drink it, the air's gonna be filthy. 
But the one thing we can never say to these people trying to come out of poverty too late is, sorry, you can't have this, it's gonna pollute the earth. The trick is this, how do we bring the world out of poverty without trashing the planet? And the answer is by producing products and services that are clever, inexpensive, and green. And that's why you're seeing that. Now, if the world's gonna come out of poverty, we're going to need more energy power than we've ever believed possible. People are living decently. You gotta light up those houses and apartments. You gotta heat them, cool them. Factories are being built all over the world to provide appliances and every other kind of product for an emerging middle class. Factories use power. That means trucks on the road, people getting to and from work, cars, buses, trains. We will have to extract more fuel from the earth than anybody ever thought possible. And there's something important happening here, and it's fracking. Tell you a story. After World War II, a group of people went to the chairman of IBM, Thomas Watson. They said, Mr. Watson, you're the world's expert on computers. What is the global market for computers? Watson said, with 100% confidence, about five. It's now considered the worst prediction in business history. What Watson could not possibly have foreseen was the semiconductor, which completely changed the cost of information and created our world. Computers, laptops, iPhones, everything else. Fracking is doing that. Fracking is now driving down the price of fuel. Not quite, but almost to the point when it's a commodity. Anybody old enough to remember Jimmy Carter and his sweater telling us to turn down the thermostat? We are now the world's leading exporter of fuel. Two months ago, an American tanker filled up with liquid natural gas in New Orleans docked it in Poland. We just smashed Vladimir Putin's 100% monopoly on natural gas sales to Eastern Europe. It's the biggest political thing in the last 10 years. Nobody noticed. Well, Putin noticed. So did our Secretary of State, who was the chairman of ExxonMobil. If the cost of energy comes down, if it almost gets to the commodity level, which is what's happening, the impact of that on our world and world economic growth is staggering. It's the biggest thing since the semiconductor. So energy is a gigantic industry of the 21st century. So is food, particularly protein. As the world emerges from poverty, infrastructure is a gigantic industry. Power stations, water treatment plants, roads, houses, whole new cities, shopping centers, office complexes, malls, parking garages, hotels, schools. Drive around, wherever you live, just get in the car, drive around for an hour. Everything you see, is what it means to be middle class. And that's now being replicated in most countries people haven't heard of. Yum Brands, which owns Kentucky Fried Chicken and Pizza Hut, reports that the busiest franchises in the world are now in Africa, Lagos. Isn't that stunning? But do you realize what that means? That means all over Africa, people are phoning in an order, some kids running down, coming back with a bucket of chicken, a pizza, putting it on the kitchen table. Kid runs in from the other room, grabs a slice of chicken, goes back into his room and slams the door because he's watching the new version of Game of Thrones on, self, on Netflix. That's stunning. And by the way, he's on our side. ISIS has nothing to offer him. He just wants a faster internet connection. Good. He's on our side. As people emerge from poverty into the middle class, they want health care. Health is a gigantic industry. Uh, it's interesting. People emerge from poverty. First thing they want is a traffic light at the kids' school so nobody gets hurt crossing the street. And then they want ambulances and all kinds of health care products. There's a company in Northern Carol California. Uh, they make the equipment that goes on ambulances, respirators and defibrillators. They can't keep up with the orders they're getting from countries they've never heard of before. So health care is big. As people emerge from poverty, they buy education. And because we're human beings, they buy entertainment. So the growth industries of the 21st century are energy, food, infrastructure, healthcare, education, and entertainment. If you look at those industries through the prism, clever, inexpensive, and green, that's how your customer base is growing exponentially. The two countries that have, in a way, led the charge out of poverty are China and India. 
and they have two of the biggest middle class societies in the world. China's running into trouble. The Chinese economic model is very simple. We make it happen, we give you cheap labor. You've done this, you know someone who has. We had dinner with these guys in Shanghai six, three years ago. We signed contracts. Six months later, the factory was open. This country takes seven years to file an environmental impact statement. Do you know how they got the, country op the factory open in six months? They shot everyone who objected to it. Ran tanks right over them. Well, China's middle class now, and you can't do that. By the way, middle class people are holding cell phones filming it. So they can't make it happen. Also, China has one of the lowest birth rates in the world. In 2017, for the first time in Chinese history, the workforce shrank. And now it's shrinking at an accelerating rate. When your workforce shrinks, wages go up. So they can't make it happen. They can't give you cheap labor. An American company says, hey, wait a minute. Fuel prices are coming down. Why should I manufacture in China? I'll move it back to Michigan or Illinois or Missouri. So the Chinese are right now in a total panic. Their entire economic model isn't working anymore. Keep your eye on India. India is coming up fast on the outside. It's a democracy. They speak English. They have the rule of law. The Indian middle class is bigger than the US population. Prime Minister of India, a man named Narendra Modi, says he wants to turn India into the world's manufacturing base. That's a polite way of saying he wants to take it from China. And he might. We'll do business with both. These are the two biggest middle class societies in the world, but everybody's so obsessed with China, they don't notice that India's going right past them. So there's a lot of stuff going on there that just isn't getting reported in the news. A couple of points before I let you go. Look, it's easy to be a pessimist these days. Things go wrong, horrible things, like the school shooting in Florida, the terrorist attacks that we see. And as I say, watching the news can drive you completely crazy. Also, pessimism is now fashionable among our intellectuals. If they can come up with a problem you or I didn't think of, it's because they're smarter than we are. On the day scientists announce a cure for cancer, it's going to be a talking head on Fox News explaining to us why, although on the surface you would think it's a good thing, you know, we're going to live longer and that's going to bankrupt Social Security and put more pressure on Medicare. You say, oh, come on, guys. So everybody's trying to find the black cloud in every silver lining. There's another concept that's really becoming very prevalent, particularly among young people, and that's the idea We've gone as far as we can go. We just have to kind of slow everything down and kind of manage our decline. That's actually not new. In 1844, the United States Commissioner of Patents, a man named Henry Ellsworth, told Congress they could close the patent office because, he said, everything had already been invented. No, not quite. In my lifetime, We've landed on the moon. We ended the Cold War. We wiped smallpox off the earth. We've nearly wiped polio off the earth. We invented the internet. We put a cell phone in the hands of almost every human being alive today. I don't think it's over. We've just begun. Now, I said at the start I wanted to be your radar. OK, here's the world we're looking at. Within your lifetimes, certainly within your children's lifetimes, the world will cross a line that's never been crossed before. Most human beings have no idea could ever be crossed. For the first time in history, the overwhelming majority of human beings will not be poor. That's staggering. We will see the emergence and exponential growth of a global middle class. This global middle class will become the most powerful force in the world, powerful politically, powerful socially, and above all, powerful economically. Its demand for the kinds of products and services you deal with is so huge, it will set off what more and more serious economists and economic institutions now believe will not merely be an economic boom, 
but a sonic boom. There is a small but rapidly growing number of economists, economic institutions, who are now saying that with a little bit of luck, if we play this right, a lot of ifs in this sentence, a lot depends on what President Trump does in the next 6, 12, 18 months, we could be on the verge of a supersonic boom. And by the way, if you look at the industries that will dominate the 21st century, that's energy, food, infrastructure, healthcare, education, entertainment, do you know what one country holds the world's leadership in all six of these industries? It's the United States. Wouldn't you think someone in Washington, D.C. would notice that? Maybe once, okay? Look, we're grown-ups. We've been around the block a dozen times. Everything takes longer than you want. Everything costs more. God knows we make mistakes. Whether we're Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives, we make mistakes. I got a call from Russian television a couple of weeks ago. They wanted to interview me. I said, what do you want to know? They said, what's President Trump going to do? I said, how the hell do I know? I don't think he knows. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing, he's going to make mistakes. He's going to make stupid mistakes because he's human. We all make stupid mistakes. And look, there really are problems. Um, the war is complicated. We have what at the CIA we used to call nuts with nukes. And that's North Korea and Iran. Uh, let me tell you something. I'm old enough to remember everything that went wrong. Anybody remember the Berlin Wall, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the shootdown of KAL-7, the hostages in Iran? We're always facing these catastrophic things. We'll get through them, okay? The bigger threat to the future isn't North Korea, it's not Iran. It's a new form of government called authoritarianism. You know, our parents' generation won the Cold War. They defeated the Nazis. We ended the Cold War. We took out the communists and the Kremlin. So the new threat isn't Nazism, it isn't communism. It's what's called authoritarianism, the strong man. Putin in Russia, Xi in China, Erdogan in Turkey. Their attitude is, hey, this is all complicated. You leave the politics to me. You shut up. Just run your business. Stay the hell out of this. And that's the new threat to the United States. Everybody's holding their breath around the world to see how we deal with this. If we can find our way through our problems, the violence in our schools, the budget deficits, health care, all these things we deal with, but whether we're Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives, we're trying to find a way through this. We are in charge of our country. It really is a democracy. If we can pull this off and retain the world's leadership, and everyone sees these authoritarians are not a match for us, then the world moves forward. Everybody wants the United States to be the world's leader. They bitch and they moan and they groan. They call us a bunch of sweaty, hairy-chested, Bible-thumping morons. Then they run into trouble. They want the 82nd Airborne. And we send it, we save everybody, and then they go back to calling us a bunch of idiots. Everybody's panic is what happens if we call the United States for help and nobody comes. What do we do? Turn to that nice Mr. Putin in Moscow? Those guys in Beijing think they're going to help us out and not ask for anything in return? So everything hinges now on whether the United States retains the world's leadership. I think we will. If we do, we're looking at a world we've never seen before a world emerging from poverty, global middle class, and the big argument among economists is whether it's an economic boom, a sonic boom, or a supersonic boom. And here we are in the middle of the country that dominates the six industries that control the 21st century. So don't let the pessimists get you down. There has never been more interesting, more optimistic, a more exciting time to be alive, to be here in the United States, to be in businesses like yours. So lucky you, and thank you for listening to me.